venerable religious and your parishioners, today is a feast of royalty. And it helps us to understand, I believe, better the royalty of our Lord Jesus Christ if we understand the honor that is paid even now to earthly monarchs, almost none of whom have complete power, more of a, of a, it's definitely a very limited power, but some tremendous marks of respect are shown to royalty. I was reading about someone who had in recent years married into the British royal family and there was a list of all the new expectations one has for being married in to a royal family and for example if the and this is regarding Queen Elizabeth II of England that once she is finished with a meal or finished conversation, everyone else has to finish that's at the table. It's time to go. No matter how interested you might be in a conversation or want to continue to eat, I think there's actually like a five-minute uh, window of opportunity to finish up, but you have to go when the queen is done. Why? honor to her royal position. Also, someone in the royal family can never turn the back to the queen. Never. In, in, at least out in public. That when they're walking along, they, if they have to walk behind her, can never walk in front of her because that would be turning the back. Why this mark of respect? Because it's really ingrained, this idea of respect to the royalty of the queen. And again, she's, she has only very limited power, at least compared to monarchs of the past. So if this is the kind of honor and respect that's given to an earthly sovereign, how much more should be the honor and reverence Indeed, it's the ultimate honor and reverence and adoration that we give to the King of Kings and to the Lord of Lords. And what a beautiful institution this was of Pope Pius XI. This feast was not very long in the church. It hasn't even been in the church for even a hundred years. It was at the end of the holy year, 1925, that Pope Pius XI wrote the encyclical on the kingship and instituted this feast. He says, we need to have this feast. He says, why? Because humanity is dethroning Christ. This was in 1925. So all the more, the need continues even more urgently to honor the king, to remember his sovereign rights over us. It is in this spirit that we will be making that act of consecration after Mass, submitting ourselves to his loving, sovereign reign over us. This is a little bit of an aside, but I want to also mention in our school we have some specific spiritual goals. And we just finished the first quarter. And so what we were trying to inspire the students with and our, the, our efforts were well rewarded, seeing the students make more reverent signs of the cross. And a particular saint that inspires that way is St. Bernadette because when she witnessed the apparitions of Our Lady, she made these reverent signs of the cross. And remember, that's an act of faith. It's a prayer in and of itself whenever you make it. It's an act of respect to God. And we're re reminding ourselves, of course, of the two great mysteries, the Holy Trinity and the Redemption. So it's always a tribute to Christ, our King. It's always a tribute to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
So we just finished the first quarter, and of course this is a habit we want them to continue to have. So something to last them throughout life. Devout, prayerful, meaningful signs of the cross. Never, you know, hastily and without, without, you know, uh, the proper reverence that is owing to this sign of faith. And by the way, it has great power over the devil as well. Many, well, all the saints, all Catholics that were trying to live a holy life made use of this uh, powerful devotion to show their, to, or to help vanquish temptation, to, 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 you know, overcome the power of the devil. But anyway, uh, we begin the second quarter tomorrow, and a specific goal we now have is genuflection. How providential that we're beginning really the second quarter today in our academic calendar, on the Feast of Christ the King. And historically, people would genuflect to the King, not as an act of adoration, but this was a tribute that was paid to many an earthly sovereign. So again, how much more should our genuflection going in and out of church be meaningful? What are we doing? We're paying homage to the King of Kings. I know we don't do this for Holy Communion. When you come up for Holy Communion, you just step out of the pew and you know come up. But normally, you know, otherwise you would genuflect going in and out of the pew and in and out of the church. Again, make it a meaningful act of reverence. That's what we want to do. Make it make it thoughtfully, make it meaningfully. And our inspiration, the saint for this second quarter to inspire to those better genuflections, is St. Louis, King of France. Why? Because as an earthly king, and he had complete power. I mean, he had, uh, there was no division of powers like we have in our country, for example, between the three branches of government. He had and that's the way monarchs ruled. They had all the power. There, there may have been some limitation. I know, for example, in England with the Magna Carta, they started to limit the power of the king. They saw the, the, the danger of a king having you know, absolute power. I don't know if there was any limitations on King Louis the Ninth, But nevertheless, this king knew his real place with regards to the King of Kings. And during the Mass, whenever the creed was chanted or recited, he started to genuflect. When we hear the words, et verbum caro factum est, and the word was made flesh. And this was such a praiseworthy custom instituted by the king. And of course, if the king did it, everybody else better do it too. That's the way it is. For example, the story about the Hallelujah Chorus, when one of the kings of England heard it for the first time, he was so moved. He heard the, those, those, uh, those magnificent, that magnificent singing, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He just stood up. And then everybody else had to stand up. So here this Catholic king, and this, he lived in the 1100s, I believe, he started genuflecting during the Mass. And this custom, so praiseworthy, was officially adopted by the Catholic Church. Why not? So the reason, one of the reasons, will be genuflecting during the Creed today is because a holy king knew his place before his king and wanted to honor him. Jesus said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. So he was emphasizing that he was primarily here as a, for the spiritual kingdom. Let's listen to the words of Pope Pius XI's encyclical. 
This kingdom is spiritual and is concerned with spiritual things. That this is so, the above quotations from Scripture amply prove, and Christ by his own action confirms it. On many occasions when the Jews and even the apostles wrongly supposed that the Messiah would restore the liberties and the kingdom of Israel, he, replied, he repelled and denied such a suggestion. When the populace thronged around him in admiration and would have acclaimed him king, he shrank from the honor and sought safety in flight. Before the Roman magistrate, he declared that his kingdom was not of this world. The Gospels present this kingdom as one which men prepare to enter by penance and cannot actually enter except by faith and by baptism. <laughs> which though an external rite signifies and produces an interior regeneration. So, again, the Pope is telling us he did not establish a civil kingdom on earth. Of course, that civil kingdom, the power of it comes from God, but our Lord did not come to rule in a, in a, in a temporal in the temporal realm. He came to rule in the spiritual realm. But let's go on to the next point, and this is, I think, of utmost importance. That doesn't mean that he is to be kept out of civil society. And this is hard for us to understand, I believe, because we've never lived in a Catholic country where he is acknowledged as king of society. Even though he didn't come to rule temporarily per se, which he could have done. After all, he's God. He can do anything. Nevertheless, the state has the duty of acknowledging him, of adoring him, and recognizing his sovereign rights over the temporal sphere, the civil government, the state. Again, let's listen to the words of Pope Pius XI. It would be a grave error, on the other hand, to say that Christ has no authority whatever in civil affairs, since by virtue of the absolute empire over all creatures committed to him by the Father, all things are in his power. Nevertheless, during his life on earth, he refrained from the exercise of such authority, and although he himself disdained to possess or to care for earthly goods, he did not and does not today interfere with those who possess them. But nevertheless, again, as Pilate, remember what Pilate said to Jesus? He says, I have the authority to release you. I have the power to punish you. And Jesus reminded him, you would have no power, Pilate, if it were not given to you from above. And he didn't mean uh, Caesar, Tiberius Caesar over in Rome. All authority comes from God. Church authority, civil authority, parental authority, it comes from God. So I wanted to share these thoughts with you of what we're doing today. We are acknowledging Jesus, his absolute sovereignty in the spiritual realm, but let us remember this, this in the civil realm, he should be acknowledged as the king as well. What do we do? We who have to live in a uh, definitely a non-Catholic world, a world that's very antithetical to Christ the King. We're told to live in the world, but not be of the world. So not to have the spirit of the world in our lives, rather have the spirit of Christ. But may I remind you that you, especially as you as laity, and I address you today, you are out there in a way that priests and religious are not. Yes, Priests especially, they are, and the clergy, their, their duty is to preach the kingdom. But they're not in the factories. They're not in the office buildings. They're not out in the, in the, in the grocery stores. They're not in the corporate world. They're not in the machine shops. 
you are. And you partake in the mission of the church by leading a fervent Catholic life of setting the example. How powerful is good example? Let's remember what St. John Chrysostom said. If Christians lived as they should, there would be no more pagans left in the world. That's the power of good example. And to lead in your place of work. And wherever you are in the world, teach the people who is their king, who is their queen, Christ, our Blessed Mother. That's your role. And it is a privilege to do so. So let us rejoice in this feast of Christ the King. Give him our hearts in a special way today. Make sure that he will always be the king of our hearts. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.